Welcome to another edition of Forecast Lab. We take a look at those teleconnections. All of that is very consistent with strong kinetic energy around the Northern Hemisphere. We have the positive North Atlantic Oscillation, that means fast flow across the Atlantic, a positive Arctic Oscillation, which means fast flow circling the Arctic region, and the Madden Julian Oscillation is in Phase 6, consistent with warm weather east of the Rockies. However, still quite a bit of cold air in the northeastern U.S., 20s and 30s in Ontario into western New York, and we've got snow all the way into northern Pennsylvania. And if you look at that thickness field, vast area of thermal troughing throughout the entire northeast region. But as you go further to the west, we pick up some warmer air, and we're into the 60s and 70s this afternoon in Colorado. Let's go region by region and take a look. We take a look at the 500 millibar heights and vorticity, and of course we focus on the northeastern U.S. We have a mid-level vortex across northern New York and the polar front jet right in this channel between cyclonic vorticity and anticyclonic vorticity. So that right there, even without looking at the wind barbs, the ice attacks, we can see right where that polar front jet is, and that's between Minnesota, Kentucky, and North Carolina. Ridging through the western U.S. and another storm system lurking off the west coast, which is already having major impacts in Oregon and Washington. So let's focus on this upper level low in New York. The water vapor satellite imagery is showing extensive spiraling right there. That's due to dry air, which has been entrained in that circulation, with moist air as well. So it forms a swirl like you might see with a bowl of ice cream or something like that. So the vortex really stands out. If we look at the visible imagery, don't see very much at the start of the day, but as we get the addition of heating, we've got extensive convective elements that's producing snow showers with rain showers along the southern periphery of that. As you can see, some cold conditions throughout this entire region, 30s across upstate New York, 40s down in the Hudson River Valley, and 30s and 40s across Pennsylvania with a patchwork of snow and rain across that region. Highs were in the 30s in the Allegheny region, 40s across the rest of the interior with 50s and 60s closer to the coast. In the southeastern states, the temperatures were mostly in the 60s. We pick up 70s closer to the Gulf Coast and 80s across Florida. We did have that 100 knot jet, remember, that extended from Illinois into Kentucky and North Carolina. So some cold advection, stratocumulus and cumulus through the central Appalachians and then clearing off as you go further south. There was a red flag warning today across the Blue Ridge Mountains into northern Georgia. It appears we've already had some wildfire issues get going along the South Carolina, North Carolina border. Let's see if we can get a closer look at that. We are not a wildfire advisory service, but I'll try to take a look at things where we can. So there's something definitely burning there. So our two problem areas, we focus on far northwestern South Carolina. That's going to be around Table Rock Reservoir. That's what's burning right now. The other fire is out here. That appears to be way up on this mountain ridge, up at about two or 3,000 feet. Shifting over to Texas, we did see upper level ridging in spite of this convective cluster. This has been going on for about 24 hours now. It initially started yesterday around Dallas and continued overnight and still going on at this hour. So it could be a little bit stronger, but the fact that we have ridging aloft that's helping to minimize a lot of this activity to a certain extent, but starting to look a little bit more like early summer on this chart, kind of a monsoon appearance. A lot of this is due to the approach of upper level troughing from Western Mexico. The weather will be getting wet in southern Texas over the next couple of days. Flood watch has been issued this afternoon into Friday for this band right here from Laredo over to Houston. Closer to Houston, the flood watch takes effect tomorrow morning. We're expecting about five to nine inches of rain in that flood watch area amounts closer to two to five inches along Interstate 10. 
In the Northern Plains, not a whole lot to talk about. The polar front jet extending from the Dakotas into Illinois. The Great Lakes looking pretty good today. Highs there were in the 30s and 40s, and they warm into the 50s and 60s through the Corn Belt region. Across the Northern Plains itself, we were looking at the 40s from Duluth and Fargo to the 70s from North Platte to Rapid City. But as you can see, a lot of sunshine on tap. In the southwestern U.S., it was warm. 70s and 80s across much of Colorado and Utah, 60s in the mountain valleys, and down to the south, this disturbance in northern Mexico producing thunderstorms in far west Texas and in northern New Mexico and even across the painted desert of Arizona. However, out to the west, some changes on the way as this strong cold front approaches the northwest California coast. For now, however, we have a high wind watch across northwestern Nevada, expecting southwest winds gusting to 60 miles an hour across Reno, Carson City, Hawthorne up into northeastern California around Susanville. For today, we have high wind warnings around the Klamath Valley, Shasta Valley, South winds gusting to 65 miles an hour, and that will cause problems on Interstate 5. There's a closer look at that system spinning around out there in the Pacific. We zoom in for a closer look, and you can see some dramatic cloud structure. Down to the south, convective elements, cold core convection. Up to the north, the more stratiform bands. And right there in the very center looks like some shallow convection. And that weather system is so deep and wound up, it's pulled warm air and moisture northward. So that warm sector has really gone up the Interstate 5 corridor, almost a tropical look to the skies there in southwestern Oregon. And we also have a slight risk in effect across the Willamette Valley into Portland and Seattle for this afternoon, looking at the possibility of maybe some large hail and maybe an isolated tornado or two. And that activity will progress eastward into eastern Washington later tonight. So possibly some lightning and thunder coming through the Columbia River Basin on up into Spokane towards midnight. As we head west into the Pacific, we get a better look at that storm system. The isobars are a little bit smooth, so very likely the central pressures are in the 970 range. But we do see that massive cold air spinning around and almost occluding that central low the main bear clinic zone is actually out there on the west coast of the u.s the jet stream likely right in between something like that all right let's head up into alaska it is quiet cold with single digits 20s and 30s down on the south coast most of our inclement weather is in the alaska panhandle right in there we had fog problems around Wrangell and Petersburg earlier this morning. The Juneau area is under a high wind warning late tonight into early Thursday due to strong northeast winds gusting to 60 miles an hour. In Canada, a mass of cold air across the Northwest Territories and Nunavut. Temperatures around minus 10 for the most part, minus 20s up there in the Western Arctic. As the impulses from this Pacific system start moving through this other bear clinic zone out there in the prairies, we could see a snowstorm developing Thursday around Edmonton and Calgary. And you can see that spreading into Winnipeg and Ontario and the Great Lakes going into Friday and Saturday. There's a look at the Canadian graphics, two distinct waves, one Saturday morning, the other on Sunday around midday, moving through the area, mixed precipitation around Sault Ste. Marie, Sudbury, snow to the north, and rain down in the lower Great Lakes. I did want to focus on our areas of concern this afternoon. We've got thunderstorms developing on the coastal range just west of Salem. This is likely going to expand in coverage over the next few hours, and that'll drive cells into Portland, and the whole area will expand to the east over the next several hours, and that'll bring convection into the interior regions as well. The high-resolution rapid refresh is always a good baseline idea of what's going to happen. It may not get the exact details right, but you can look at the trends, the aerial extent, and just kind of modify it as you go. Now, we do see that the model goes for convection on the Cascades instead of on the coastal range. We're seeing that a little bit differently with the real-time data. 
but you know this is t still valuable. We can see that it has an expansion of any convective areas into the evening, up into six, seven o'clock, and certainly parts of well, actually much of western Washington is going to get that as well. East of the Cascades, it's a little bit more uncertain. You can see that there is kind of a hard limit right in here, so maybe eastern. Washington may not see very much. It does tend to pick up a few cells right here. That's probably orographically induced. Looks like most of the high desert does remain dry. But as cells develop further into the morning hours and we get the addition of daytime heating, we could see regeneration out there in the eastern part of Washington and Oregon. So I guess maybe Spokane may not pick up very much, but certainly this is pointing to Seattle and Portland, the Dalles, Yakima getting convection. And of course, things well underway, we're going to see this area of convection aggregate into a multi-cell cluster and basically just spread out across Portland, those areas mentioned earlier, into western Washington as well. So we'll be busy. And of course, the second wave associated with the front on the west coast, that could bring some strong showers as well. And we are getting an early start to these rains in South Texas. Extensive rains moving into the San Antonio area, Hondo, Uvalde, and all the way towards Victoria and just north of Corpus Christi. I don't have the full loop on here, but it is organizing and we're expecting probably a good 24 to 36 hours of this precipitation. Of course, the high resolution rapid refresh, very good for a look at what's going to happen. We see the convection around San Antonio persist for a few hours and then start shutting down. Now, down around Laredo, Monterey, that appears to be active well into the evening hours, and that makes me wonder if maybe we're getting some augmentation with the developing low-level jet. It appears that persists into the morning hours tomorrow. Up to the north, things appear to stay shut down, so probably convectively overturned. For a look further ahead, we take a look at the 3-kilometer NAM. At the start, it's very similar to what we have right now. We see the cells shutting down around San Antonio just after dark. It does go a little bit more aggressively with this cluster around Corpus Christi and Victoria, not so much down to the south around Laredo. So right there, that's a discrepancy between those two models. So a little bit of positioning error. The high resolution rapid refresh focusing on this area around dawn, the NAM further to the north. So it's going to be interesting to see which one wins out. As we get the addition of heating, this area gets going around Corpus Christi. So just kind of a mess of convective clusters, boundary interactions, and uncertainty. So one thing you can do going into tonight is keep tabs on the weather and see which area is the one becoming active. And that'll kind of give you an idea which way the forecast will steer. Okay, let's look at the forecast. For tonight with this thermal troughing extending into the northeastern U.S., very cold. We'll see widespread 20s overnight. As far south as Portland, Maine, Poughkeepsie, Harrisburg, Pittsburgh, 30s in the Northeastern Corridor. Then for tomorrow, active once again in South Texas. Again, the details were not exactly certain, but there will be a lot of wet weather down there. An increase in precipitation. Here's some of the forecast totals at this time. 1 to 1.75 inch precipitable water helping to augment that precipitation accumulation. Slight risk of severe thunderstorms in most of South Texas, the main risk being downburst winds and hail. In the north central U.S., a big warm up for Kansas. We're going to see temperatures coming up into the mid 80s. Hill City, Tribune, and Syracuse could be up to 90 degrees, and the model trying to pop some precip there with that very strong heating. Downburst winds and hail, that'll be the main concern. And some of that may extend up into the St. Joseph area, where we have a slight risk for tomorrow. In the southwestern U.S., one more hot day. Things about 10 degrees cooler starting on Friday. And that polar front jet moving into the Bay Area, Sacramento, west-southwest winds up to 120 knots at 500 millibars. These are the forecast precipitation totals. We'll see heavy rainfall across the northern California coastal range with a few thunderstorms. 
and in the Sierras, snow levels dropping from about 8,000 to 5,500 for Thursday. And of course, in the northwestern U.S., extensive rains and wind as the main occluded low starts grazing the coast. Then we go into Friday. This area of rain moves into East Texas. There's going to be a marginal risk of severe weather across Louisiana, southwest Arkansas, and East Texas. The environment there not particularly conducive to severe weather, but with the addition of afternoon heating and some veering of the winds, we could see a few isolated severe storms. 80s from central Nebraska up into South Dakota, Let's take a look at that. Yeah, that's going to be right there in that warm sector. But up to the north, there's that wintry weather across Lake Superior. So quite a difference in weather between North Dakota and Kansas. It is going to be a very cold night across the Great Basin area Friday night. We'll see widespread 30s there, Salt Lake City down to 42. And of course, in the Dakotas, temperatures down into the 20s across North Dakota and Minnesota. Then for Saturday, we really crank up the heat in Texas, widespread 90s west of I-35. Thankfully, from San Antonio to Dallas, only seeing mid to upper 80s. Blowing dust, yeah, that may kick up once again in El Paso for Saturday. Cold air surges into the central plains, highs ranging from the 80s in southeastern Kansas to the 60s in northwestern Kansas. 64 for Denver for a high. Then we go on to Sunday. Yeah, looking at a possible severe weather day coming up for Sunday along this cold front, maybe along and just ahead of it. So Memphis down to Vicksburg, El Dorado, maybe up to Paducah. We could be looking at some severe weather. It's kind of uncanny how every weekend that area gets severe weather. Maybe somebody needs to do a study on that. In California, a new storm system with a westerly 110-knot jet extending into central California. Cold air flows down through the northern plains, highs in the 40s from Milwaukee to Omaha in Denver. Snow will reach as far south as Interstate 80 in Nebraska and possibly Interstate 70, just briefly right there, Sunday morning in eastern Colorado. Okay, we forwarded up to Monday, lots of clearing dry advection across the eastern part of the country, maybe some severe weather down there around Georgia, Alabama, and the Carolinas. And we're getting into the extended period, so I'm not going to cover this too much, but it looks very active there on the west coast. Wow, one system after another. This is almost like an El Nino season, even though officially it is La Nina. But it's good they're getting this moisture. They really need it because dry season is about to kick in in the next one to two months. And that's going to be it for this forecast. So I hope you all enjoyed this show. Thank you very much for joining us and for being a supporter. Of course, not everybody is a supporter. You can go to patreon.com to remedy that. There's our link for that. Or you can just head to weathergraphics.com if you want to get something back. We've got some great forecasting books there. That weathergraphics.com site is all run directly from here. So all of your money, except for the printing costs, goes to help myself and this program. So check that out. And I'm sure you'll enjoy those books as well. All right. Hope you all have a great Wednesday evening. Take care and we'll see you again on Friday. Bye-bye.